think it's time we get started. I want to say thank you to everyone for joining and welcome to the Indian Peaks chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society meeting for May 2021. For those who are unfamiliar, CAS is a nonprofit organization uh, committed to the stewardship of archaeological resources in Colorado. We achieve this through public education, research, preservation, advocacy, and enhanced opportunities for responsible participation in archaeology. You can find out more about CAS and other chapters by visiting coloradoarchaeology.org. The Indian Peaks chapter is about 40 years old and represents members across the state, but primarily in Boulder County. We present these monthly lectures that are free and open to the public. We offer our members opportunities to participate in events and projects, from curation to field work, tours, lectures, and a yearly conference. For more information or to join our chapter or other CAST chapters, check out ipcast.org for info. For these monthly meetings, we have a brief business meeting before the feature presentation. Let's jump into general business. Senior membership, the senior membership category is officially eliminated. Contact Indian Peaks Archaeology at Gmail to renew. There will be no in-person events through at least June, unfortunately. <laughs> Chapter meetings are suspended throughout the summer. Regular programming will resume in September. The IPCAS annual picnic will return on September 12th, 2021, so make sure to mark your calendars. Details will be announced this summer. The 2021 annual meeting will be held in person in Montrose on October 8th through 10th, hosted by the Chipita chapter. And there will be no more PAC offerings until fall, and no PAC field season is scheduled for this year, unfortunately. So a little bit of good news, <laughs> but a lot of bad news. <laughs> All right, let's move on to community events. Um, as you can see, this is a schedule of our upcoming community events. We want to give a special mention to the virtual public meetings for the Amache spe uh, Special Resource Study. These are the last public participation opportunity to give comment and support for including Amache Granada Relocation Center as part of the National Park Service sites. This will preserve Amache in perpetuity and is supported by stakeholders, researchers, and former internees. Please join for one of the meetings to show your support or to give, give a public comment on the Amache Special Resources Study website. We'll go ahead and put that link for you in the chat below. All right, April's lecture is also um, on the IPCAS YouTube channel that was on the excavation of the Lessard site. Um, as always, make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on our lecture series. As a reminder, you can change your screen layout by selecting the three little dots in the corner of your screen. Please save your questions until the end of the lecture by selecting the raise, the raise your hand icon or to type your questions in the chat box. We also request that during the lecture you keep yourself muted and turn off your video feed to avoid disrupting the lecture. Tonight's guest is Claire Novotny from Kenyon College who is actually a Boulder native. Welcome Dr. Novotny. Thanks Brittany. Uh, it is great to be here. I'm going to share my screen with you guys and then get started. Um, so as Brittany said, I grew up in Boulder, and so it's exciting for me to be talking to you for that reason tonight. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you for Brittany um, for the invitation, and thanks for moving your meeting time to a different, uh, different, a little bit of a different time for you guys, a different schedule. I'm on the East Coast, and so, you know, uh, <laughs> talking earlier is really helpful for me. So thank you for that. Uh, this is my acknowledgement slide. I start out my talks now usually thanking people instead of waiting till the end. So this project was conducted in Belize as part of the Chan Cheech Archaeological Project, which is an, a project run through Texas Tech University and Kenyon College and the, as part of the Belize Estates Archaeological Survey Team and were funded by the Alpha Wood Foundation out of Chicago. Uh, and so I also want to thank the, the workmen that we worked with, the Belizeans that did a lot of the heavy lifting, as you'll see, uh, to conduct these excavations. Uh, and um, 
the Institute of Archaeology in Belize for giving us permission as well to conduct this research. So I've entitled my presentation today, Games of Fate and Chance, Ancient Maya, Patoli, Gallon Jug, Belize. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, Brittany said I should introduce myself or <laughs> a little bit more. Um, like I said, I uh, teach at Kenyon College and I've been here for about five years. I am, uh, I went to the UNC, UNC Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and got my PhD in 2015. I am interested in the ancient Maya, as you'll hear about tonight, and I do research in Belize, both northwestern Belize at the site of Gallon Jug, which is what you'll hear about, and also in southern Belize as well in the Toledo district. I'm interested in Maya households, so instead of excavating at enormous temples and big monumental architecture, I'm interested in what the common people were doing in their everyday lives. And I'm also interested in the contemporary impacts of archaeology on, on people who live close to archaeological sites. And so while I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, community archaeology and outreach to local people is also a big part of, of my research program. So that's my, my introduction. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk about the site of Gallon Jug and this discovery that we made a couple of years ago in 2019 of patoli boards that were incised into a plaster floor on a platform structure in a group that I'll call uh, Courtyard B1, which is an, a residential group at Gallon Jug. Patoli boards are interesting because they're interpreted as game boards for gambling and leisurely play, in addition to ritual practices and divination. So we see a combination of these two practices with patoli boards. And they fall under this wider sort of umbrella of graffiti, which is interesting, right? Graffiti being sort of informal carvings um, into plaster or stucco that we find throughout the, the Maya world. And since they're informal, they give us a sense of what common people might have been experiencing or viewing when they attended ceremonies and things like that. Uh, but it gives us a sense that um, of kind of a more sense of holistic worldview um, from common people. And so uh, well, I'll touch more on that in a, in a little bit. But this, these lived experiences that you don't really get to see in other contexts archaeologically. So since Patoli combine ritual and gaming, um, they give us some really interesting insights into Maya culture. And so these patoli from Gallon Jug are a little bit unique, and so that's what I'll, I'll tell you about when I, when I get to that. But first, I'm going to... Uh, give you sort of a, a background to the ancient Maya and put some of these discoveries into context. So um, when I talk about the ancient Maya, of course, I'm talking about Mesoamerica. This is a great map from National Geographic that I use um, in my classes because it gives you a sense of the different civilizations and time periods that we're talking about. So the Maya are in this tan color here. You can, hopefully you can see my mouse. Uh, and the, t the tan here and the lowlands is where uh, the Maya are geographically. I'm also going to touch on the Aztec, which is the green color here, focused on the basin of Mexico and their empire that spread throughout Mesoamerica uh, in the post-classic period. We have some great ethnohistoric sources from there that I will um, talk about. What I'm talking about the time period I'm discussing really is the classic period, so AD 250 to 830. Um, and there are early and late facets to the, the classic period. Mostly what I'll be talking about is in the late classic and then a little bit into the terminal classic. So we're talking about really the end of this classic Maya uh, fluorescence of civilization. And when I talk about the ancient Maya, I'm I'm talking about the the Maya speakers, right, who lived in this geographic region uh, of Mexico and Central America. And there are people that built a very complex society that was focused on divine kingship. And these divine kings were, they kind of combined the idea of a ritual practitioner or a shaman, you might say, with uh, political uh, influence and militarism and they sort of combined all of this into one person and ruled these city-states uh, throughout the Maya lowlands and they were responsible for 
producing these works of art that we do see quite a bit in, in museums like this vase, this rollout. This is a vase that's actually all circular or a cylinder because it is a vase. But through photography, we, we can take pictures and, and we call them rollouts. So this is a sort of two-dimensional version of a three-dimensional cylinder vessel. You can see a courtly scene here. And this is um, just an example of sort of the high quality Maya art that was produced during this classic period, in addition to the architecture, uh, things like that. Those are the ancient Maya. Um, when we're talking about games, you know, I'm as an archaeologist, I'm also an anthropologist. So I study culture and human culture and human behavior more broadly. And so I like to put things into, into that context. And when we can think about play um, anthropologically, we think about the fact that it's really universal. It's cross-cultural. It's universal to all humans. All humans play. Um, people have different kinds of games, but play is pretty universal. There are animals that play, of course, if you have cats or dogs or pets, you, you've likely seen this, right? Um, so play is pleasurable. It is obviously voluntary. There are some parameters to it. Um, but in the animal world, you know, you're sort of testing strength and learning about maybe social hierarchy. But for humans, play can be really important because you might also be testing boundaries, learning about your own body and what, what hurts and what doesn't hurt, uh, for example. But we give meaning to our play and we uh, create toys like this little wheeled toy that's from uh, Mesoamerica. Um, and, we, and we give meaning to, to these, we bring in make believe uh, and it can be a real way to, for kids to learn. Um, play is not only for, for kids, of course. Uh, many adults also play, and we also have games, right, that are defined as recreational activities characterized by organization as well as competition. So it is more organized play. We can think of games in that way. And anthropologists have grouped these into several categories that helps us kind of understand them and apply them. One is physical skills, so we can think about games of sport and wrestling or something like that, something that tests your athleticism. Uh, you can also think about games that are based on strategy. Uh, many board games that we play are based on strategy, risk, for example, or I don't know, Monopoly or something like that. But then there are also games of chance uh, that are more like like dice games or, or things of that nature, where you can't really control the outcome, but you're hoping for for a certain a certain result. In um, in more complex societies, you know, you do see lots of games of strategy, uh, but chance games are correlated with religious activities as well. Um, and so I'll get into that a little more as we as we go forward, because Patoli is a game of chance, and so it does have these really interesting religious and ritual elements. But first, I want to give you some things to think about in terms of how the ancient Maya and the Aztec saw their world. What was their worldview like? Because in order to think about games and ritual, we kind of have to understand what they thought about chance. Their idea of chance is not totally the same as our idea of chance. It's much more connected to, again, their worldview and, and how they perceive themselves in relation to other people and the environment. So when I, when I teach Mesoamerican archaeology, I often start my class talking about the environment and the landscape of Mesoamerica because it is quite distinctive and it really shapes the way that people relate to each other. So they exist, people living in this region exist in a really uncertain environment. It's very active. So you have, for example, this map of Mesoamerica showing active, an active earthquake zone across pretty much the entire region. Uh, along with that, you have bands of volcanoes, uh, volcanic activity. Um, this volcano in Mexico City uh, erupted as re recently as 2013. Um, and so these are active volcanoes that are, uh, you know, unpredictable as to when they're going to erupt. And you can see there's volcanoes all down through Guatemala and El Salvador. So you have, you know, an active, active volcanoes, you have earthquakes happening. Water is either very abundant or not abundant enough. 
you have seasonal rains in many of these of these regions that come in very fiercely and drop a lot of water and then there's a dry season and so that seasonality you know it is predictable to a certain extent but during the dry season you might have to come up with strategies for keeping water uh, in places where you might not have it in the gulf of mexico you have these mangrove swamps along the coast and then you have mountains with these massive rivers draining down into the Gulf. Uh, you have very warm water, right, of the Caribbean and the Atlantic that bring hurricanes against the Yucatan Peninsula and through the Gulf of Mexico, uh, another sort of unpredictable and difficult to, uh, to deal with, you know, phenomenon. Um, so, you know, the, and the other point I want to make about water is that it is both coming from the sky and coming from below the earth. So in the Yucatan Peninsula, for example, you have cenotes or sinkholes, uh, and the, the bedrock through most of this region is a karst limestone, which means it's very porous. And so you'll have underground caves, sinkholes, as I mentioned, um, and so you have water that can be accessed underground, and it's also coming from the sky. So. The watery underworld of caves is an important uh, part of their cosmology. I'll come back to that in a second. You also have different environmental zones, some that are very dry, like I said, and some that are very, very wet. Uh, the lowlands where Tikal, the ancient Maya site of Tikal is located in Guatemala, is a very wet rainforest type of place, very biodiverse, lots of animals and things like that. Animals are abundant, but can also be dangerous. So you have this environment that is, is capricious, right? And that you might not be able to totally control it. So Mesoamerican cultures develop belief systems uh, in part to buffer these risks of living in this really dynamic environment. They also come up with lots of practical ways to feed themselves and their kids uh, and to save water in um, in reservoirs and basins and, and jars. Uh, so they're also very, very practical, but I think it's important when we think about, about ritual to understand the environment that they're living in. The other important point that I want to make here is that the, the Maya in particular, as well as the Aztec who I'll talk about, believed that the environment and also objects were charged with an animated energy. So I want you to keep in mind that everything around them was thought to be alive in a sense. Every natural feature, every animal, vegetable, mineral um, is possesses this force that is that requires offerings. It requires um, sacrifice. This is where we get the idea of sacrifice in Mesoamerica, is that you know the landscape is charged with this energy, it's given to you by the gods, and you need to uh, be thankful for that and offer sacrifice in return. That's the the role of humans in this in this relationship. So you have um, you know this landscape that's really difficult to control and also animated. So that's a lot <laughs> to think about, right? When you're thinking about the way that the world works and your place in it. So in order to kind of grapple with these with these ideas, um, the Maya in particular, as well as well as the Aztec, really Mesoamerican peoples share some really common uh, cosmo vision. So their their view of not just the cosmos as the heavens, but the way the world is is shaped, um, and it's focused on this world tree, as you can see in the diagram on the right hand side. The world tree is connecting the upper world with the watery underworld that I mentioned before, which, you know, they get this idea really from caves that they see on the landscape. The upper world is the heavens, and of course the sun and the stars, they're great astronomers. They're watching the sun and the cycles of Venus, for example, but this world tree is connecting that upper world with the middle world of people, to the underworld. The surface of the earth is divided into cardinal directions that are associated with different colors. Um, and uh, there's different, there's a lot of different symbolism happening in Maya Cosmovision. But the important thing that I want you to remember is, is the world tree, this, uh, this cross shape that uh, connects uh, the world in the cardinal directions. The second point that I wanna make when we think about worldview and fate is the calendar. And the Maya calendar 
is cyclical and I could do a whole lecture just on the Maya calendar, but the important point here is that uh, it goes in cycles and days, this is the, the name days of, uh, of, of, the Maya, of the Maya calendar and their associated glyphs, each day has a certain auspiciousness to it. And so if you're born on a certain day, you might have more luck than another person. Um, each day has its own qualities. And so that is an interesting phenomenon to think about, that if you're born on an unlucky day, that you might have to do more sort of sacrifice. You might have to live a more humble life in order to make up for that bad fortune of being born on an unlucky day. Or if you're born on a more lucky day, a more auspicious day, perhaps you will be more fortunate and you might not have to worry as much. It's not that your fate is set in stone because of the day that you're born, uh, but it does play into your fortunes. So here we have a sense with this with this calendar that uh, that there is some wiggle room there that you might have um, you have a, a sense of fate from the day that you're born, but then also maybe maybe you can change that a little bit. All right, so um, in terms of ritual play, I wanna sort of combine these ideas of, of playing and games with uh, some of the more ritual things that I was just talking about. When we talk about the ancient Maya, we see from really their very beginnings that games are an important part of, of their ritual and of understanding their rituals. So the Popol Vuh is their creation story. It was written down in colonial times in the Quiche language in Highland Guatemala. However, we do see evidence going back to the classic period and even earlier into the pre-classic period that tells the story of, of Maya creation. Um, and it's, it's a little complex. I don't have time to tell you the whole story today, although there is an animated version um, of the Popol Vuh that's on YouTube. That's really quite wonderful if you're interested. I recommend that. The essential part for, for the talk today is that the Popol Vuh is about the hero twins, Hunahunapu and Shvalan K, and they go and play ball against the lords of the underworld, and they defeat the lords of the underworld in order for the maize god, their father, to rise and bring maize and agricultural fertility to humans. And so um, there's a lot more, again, that goes on with that story, but the essential point is that they're playing this game against death essentially and winning and so the ball game we see uh, throughout mesoamerica it has an architectural component you have ball courts that you find in ceremonial centers and so we we find those you know throughout the maya region and so we know that uh, people are playing mostly elites and kings are reenacting this creation story in their ceremonial spaces and playing this game. It also is associated with sacrifice and there's some evidence that the losers were perhaps uh, sacrificed at, at the end of the game. So that's one example of ritual play. And we also see in, in more common areas, uh, figurines and whistles. So uh, these are a few examples from the Peabody Museum, but you can see that uh, these figurines are carved in in uh, sort of effigy animals, that's a peccary, I believe, <laughs> that little whistle. And then you have images of humans as well. And this gives us a sense of, first of all, different kinds of people that were around. The figurine on the right is a dwarf. Um, and we do see dwarves in palace scenes and in carved in figurines. And so we know they had an active presence in Maya courts, which is interesting. But these are also they're whistles, some of them, and so they make a sound and they uh, are often found in household contexts, but they're also found in burials, for example. We have this amazing narrative scene of these figurines that are arranged um, in a burial at the site of Waka, which is in Guatemala. And these figurines are reenacting, the interpretation is that the king and queen are up on the sort of upper left-hand side. And they're, these are courtiers and there's some, uh, sort of ritual practitioners and diviners as well. Uh, there's also some boxers and people wearing ball court or ball playing gear. And so the scene is 
interpreted as telling the story of the resurrection of the king um, through some of these associated games. And we're not totally sure how that would work, but it's clear from the figurines that uh, games like boxing and ball playing were a big part of this of this ritual. So we can see here that, you know, playing is fun and people do just play games, you know, for leisure activity, but here we're seeing that it also has a lot of cultural meaning for the Maya. And I just want to point out again that graffiti is this really important way that we can learn about uh, different parts of society and who was uh, who was present at some of these ball games. Uh, to call again the site in the Peyton that I mentioned um, before, and it was on the original map, uh, I think that I showed. There's a lot of graffiti at Tikal. It's a very well studied site. I think that's why um, we do see graffiti in other places as well. Um, but here are some some drawings of graffiti from Tikal, and you can see there's a ball game there in the in the upper part of this of this drawing. And then you also have these guys are on these sort of looks like they're on architecture, but then they have these sort of spirit animals behind them um, that are kind of watching over them. And then, so here's this, these guys and they have their, their big kind of effigy, uh, sort of supernatural animal helpers. These were sometimes taken into battle as well. We have some iconography of that. But anyways, this is an informal graffiti carving onto a wall somewhere in Tikal. So these are interesting to think about because they're informal and because they're incised. Um, so they're kind of permanent. So people have decided they're sitting around here and they wanna, they've want they seen some kind of performance and they wanna carve it onto the wall. Uh, it's unclear sort of why that is, um, but it gives us this really interesting perspective. Most of the views that we get of Maya culture are from the sort of elite or uh, ruling class because they're the ones commissioning the artwork. And so with graffiti, we get a view from a different vantage point. And I also included Heoberto Mahler, an early explorer and photographer, uh, left his own graffiti at Tikal um, in the late 19th century when he was exploring. So, you know, as I'm sure you can tell, gaming and graffiti not just for the ancient Maya, but we also, in more of the present day, uh, we also partake. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about the Aztec. I'm getting to Gallon Jug, I promise, in just one minute, but uh, most of what we know about Patoli comes from ethno-historic sources. And ethno-historic sources were usually written by uh, by friars or priests in the colonial period, or just after just after the conquest, when they had uh, Nahuatl-speaking informants who were telling them about Aztec culture uh, and making these wonderful drawings, uh, sort of in this uh, Nahuatl or Aztec style. Of course, the priests were trying to convert local people to Christianity, and so they wanted to know about. Uh, life and society and ritual in order to do that. But it ends up being a really rich uh, ethno-historic source for archaeologists and historians to understand uh, more of, of Aztec society. And so this is where we get a lot of information about, about Patoli. Um, as you can see, uh, the Aztec played Patoli on this cross-shaped board. The Patoli players from the Florentine Codex, you can see on the left-hand side, um, are playing on this cross-shaped board. And I'll just point out here that this is frequently linked to Cosmovision and cosmology. So if you remember the world tree that I showed and the cardinal directions, um, it's the, the interpretation is that these Patoli games are referencing that uh, sort of worldview, that Cosmovision. Patoli was played with, it's basically a dice game. And so the Patol beans are what these guys are throwing. And usually there's five, I only see four in that picture, but usually there's five uh, uh, Patoli, Patol beans and they are thrown. And uh, there's different squares, as you can see on the board. And the point is to roll the dice and then move a, a colored pebble or a piece of ceramic sherd around the board until you have moved your pieces off the board. And when you throw the dice, the configuration that they land in will tell you how many places to move. So there is a modern version of Patoli, um, but we don't really know all of the rules for the ancient version. 
we do know that it was a gambling game for sure because the priests recorded this in these ethnohistoric sources that you would bet you know like this guy in the upper right hand corner from the codex mendoza seems like he's just taken his cloak off and just thrown it down uh you know to to bet his cloak on this patoli game uh people were betting all sorts of things that they had, um, including their freedom. You could bet your own freedom and be sold into slavery if you <laughs> if you gambled too much. Um, and so, uh, you know, it is spoken of as uh, a social game, um, but then also potentially problematic um, in terms of being a ritual game. You also have the deity who is overseeing um, this game in this other this sort of central image, and uh, it's important to point out that this is a game of chance, and so people are trying to test their luck, and they are, you know, first blessing usually their uh, their their patrol beans and the things that they are betting in order to have better luck, and so they're kind of giving offerings to this deity to help them and to better their chances of of winning the game. Uh, the ethnohistorical record tells us that this was really popular among the Aztec nobility, but we also know that commoners played it as well. There are sources that tell us about commoners who had mats that were patoli boards that were so not incised ones like the ones in the Maya region, but like painted onto a mat and they would go from town to town and, and you know, scare up a patoli game. Um, but they make it clear the uh, the sources that this was a social gambling game, um, and in fact, it potentially could end poorly for you if you had gambled all of your all of your stuff away and caused a big ruckus in town. You could potentially be executed, apparently, for playing patoli. So this plays into the Aztec uh, view of of humility and you know offering one's life um, to the gods in a humble way is sort of the Aztec ideal. If you know anything about ancient Sparta, they're kind of like the Spartans. It's very uh, kind of stripped down. You're not supposed to be publicly, you know, drunk or anything. You're supposed to behave in a certain way. And if you don't, there are stiff punishments. So we know a little bit of, of about Patoli and, and the way that it worked um, from the Aztec. But I'll tell you about Maya Patoli now briefly, which we only have archeological examples from. These are all from the classic period, uh, from the early classic around starting in AD 250 until sort of the late and terminal classic. So you can think you know, around AD 900, say. The map on the left is are all the sites that have Patoli boards that they've been identified. So you can see Tikal there in the middle of the, of the Pay 10. Um, these are all lowland sites, which is interesting. Um, there's no patoli that have been found sort of up in the Maya highlands and in Guatemala, they're all in the lowlands. So that's, that's an unexplained pattern, but you can see from the map that that's what the evidence tells us so far. Um, there's you know, roughly around 70 or so examples from these different sites. There are several different types or styles of boards that have been found in the Maya region. The first type looks very much like the one that the Aztec uh, preferred, this sort of cross type. Um, the one that's most common in the Maya region is type B, which is this cross and frame board. And then type C, D, and E are less commonly found, um, but but they are they are found sometimes. And so uh, one has sort of these twists at the corners, one is circular, uh, and then another is kind of a ladder style. And so there's these five different um, styles. There is some variability in style from site to site, um, as well as boards that might not have been actually playable, that might be carved like vertically on a wall, where you certainly couldn't roll dice. Um, but uh, for the most part, they do seem to be to be playable. So where do we find them? What's the architectural context in the Maya region? So again, they're mostly a, a, in the lowlands. And 
Mostly we see them in civic ceremonial temples and palaces. So for example, at Shinan Tunich in Belize, this is the Castillo, it's the main sort of ceremonial precinct at this classic Maya site. And uh, there have been Patoli boards found in the palace associated with the, the Castillo here. Uh, these other drawings are from Tikal. You can sort of faintly see this cross and frame board here. Um, it's very late. Uh, it's not a classic period example, um, but this potent, this one is the sort of circular board on the floor here of this um, of this structure. So, you know, they're they're found in places where rituals and ceremonies may have taken place. And I'll just want to also point out that part of how Patoli are connected to ritual is again that sense of chance and fate, and in in particular the idea of divination. So when you live in a place that is unpredictable, has an unpredictable sort of weather patterns, uh, and also might have a lot of social upheaval, which we do see in the Maya lowlands in the late and terminal classic, you see cities fighting each other, uh, that the idea of divination is there to help people understand and deal with their anxiety about what might come in the future. And we have, you know, evidence of ritual practitioners, for example, who might have um, divining sticks um, or bone, engraved bone sticks that we have found archaeologically that are interpreted as uh, being part of divination. And much like Patoli, you would sort of throw sticks um, or maize kernels on the ground or on a board. And the way that those objects fell would tell the ritual practitioner um, something about the future, the circumstances, or the questions that they had. So that's why we find these boards mostly in temples and palaces, because it seems like they might be part of divination rituals. So gambling, also divination. They're, they're, they're covering a lot of bases here. All right, so Gallon Jug is a site that, again, we have worked at for a few years. Um, it was first documented in 1990, and we came back uh, to resume field work there in 2018. It's located sort of between the major centers of Chan Chich, as you can see on the map on the left, and the site of Punta de Cacao, and these are much larger sites with monumental architecture and um, you know stela, which are monuments that were carved by kings that were ad you know advertising their success in in warfare or um, activities in terms of uh, uh, sort of ritual activities. Um, Gallon Jug is a smaller site, and you can see it does have a monumental some monumental architecture, the site core is on the right here. There is quite a large pyramid and then some range structures. So it's it's a it's a big site, but it's not nearly as as grand as a um, as other sites. This is a, a photo looking across the main plaza so you can kind of see uh, one of the big range structures there in the back through the trees. This is our mapping crew making this map a couple of years ago. Um, when archaeological sites are still forested, it can be quite hard to photograph them. So that's that's as best as I can do right now. Um, so our goals in the 2018 season were to sort of clarify when the site was occupied. And we did some excavations in the plaza, and it seems that it was founded in the early classic period around AD 250 or 300. So that was its initial occupation. And then coming back in 2019, as I said in the introduction, I'm interested in household archaeology and I'm interested in the ways that people live their daily lives and what that can tell us about their relationship to these, these larger political centers. And so to answer some of those questions, we chose group B1, which is a residential courtyard, residential group uh, for excavations. It was also pretty well preserved. Um, some of these structures will have looters pits in them. We, there was one looters pit in this in this site, but it wasn't very big, which is good. Um, so we chose group B1 because again, it was pretty well preserved and had a nice little courtyard group. 
this grouping of structures is pretty common in the Maya region. It's a common way for people to live, for an extended family, for example, to build three or four residences around a central area where they can you know, conduct different activities um, and hang out and uh, kind of all live together. And so that it's a pretty common architectural form. So you can see um, in this map that there are four structures here. Um, B1, B2, B3 is a really long structure that really probably has a stairway here. It's probably an entrance, the ancient kind of entrance into the courtyard and then structure B4. And then this is a Choltoon, which is kind of a, a, a man-made, a human dug pit uh, that was used for storage of water or other um, sort of perishable materials. So that's in the center there. And these are a photo of our excavations. Um, so this is, this is where we excavated. So today I'm gonna to focus on structure B4. Um, it forms the northern edge of this courtyard. So you can see that uh, there's several buildings here, four, four structures, um, and courtyard B, sorry, structure B4 is five meters wide and two meters high. You can picture that. Uh, and it's constructed of, of worked limestone blocks, as you can see in the picture. It has um, a platform face, some very poorly eroded steps, um, and it's really hard to picture, I know. This is eroded, an, a plastered balustrade, and some steps leading down to, this is the, the ancient courtyard floor right here. So this picture that you're looking at was taken right here in unit C, looking up to the top, and this is the summit of the structure and the floor that I'll, that I'll talk about in a second. So it would have been, the walls are fairly low. It would not have had a vault or what I mean by that is a stone roof. It would have had a thatch roof, a perishable structure. So probably the walls were about a meter high and then it had uh, you know, sticks, what we call wattle and daub. So sticks with um, clay or mud in between them um, as the, the superstructure. And then this nice plastered floor on the inside. And so it's it's wide. I'll show you another picture of it, but it's it is a, a wide floor that's pretty open. Um, and the wide entrance here, the wide stairway uh, is is significant. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, hopefully you can picture this, picture this in your minds. So there were two significant things that we found when we excavated here at Structure B4. One of them is the Patoli boards, and the other was this really high density artifact deposit that was left right on top of the Patoli boards. So on the left is a sort of bird's eye drawing of where the boards are located in relation to each other. The artifact deposit, as you can see, is right on top of most of the boards. and uh, we didn't get to excavate the entire uh, floor, the entire building, because there was a lot of trees that were uh, were there and we couldn't get around the trees, but we excavated quite a bit of it. I would say probably 90% of it. The, the picture on the right, you can see the northern structure wall here. This is the entranceway that I was describing to you a minute ago, the southern structure wall, and then you can't really see them in the picture, but the Patoli boards were carved right here. These are really difficult to document <laughs> as graffiti, as incised lines into this, you know, very matte sort of uh, white plaster floor. It was really difficult to draw them and to photograph them. Um, so we did our best. These are uh, these are ortho photos. So these are stitched together images of probably a thousand different pictures that we took of the floor. And then I traced over the Patoli boards so that you can see them better. So we have some here um, further to the west, and then this, these are more in the central zone. And it might not look like much <laughs> um, because some of them are not complete or they are too eroded um, to, to see what shape they would have had. But I think that what we have here are some eroded cross and frame boards. And I'll show you a picture of the other uh, Patoli to reference in a second. Um, but we also have, this is a cross and frame, but it has these interesting circular elements that are, are unique. And I'll tell you about that again in a second. We also have a version of these Patoli boards that have these sort of twisted sides um, and then some more cross and frame boards there. 
usually when you find pozzoli in this part of the Maya lowlands, you only find one or two, um, usually just one of them, one cross and frame board. And here we have multiple, we have multiple versions, we have multiple styles, and we have them that are carved on top of each other, they overlap. So this um, one that is traced in white is beneath the other one, so it's an earlier version, and then these were carved on top. And so, you know, patoli are a little bit enigmatic in the sense that um, we're not totally sure uh, how long, the, you know, um, we're not totally sure what the, all the rules were for the different styles of boards um, or why they're there, if they're just, just gaming or if they are also uh, using this in a ritual practice. So this, for reference, here's those different styles of patoli boards here. Um, and then the ones from, from Gallon Jug in that central portion. And you can see that what we have, this is the cross and frame, again, the most commonly found patoli board in the Maya Lowlands. Um, so we have maybe some of these over here, uh, sort of partially. Um, we, we might have an example of type C with these curved elements. And then these two are unique. These styles are based on all of the known patoli boards that we have in the Maya Lowlands. And these look like a hybrid to me between types B and D, perhaps. Um, not totally sure what that means yet. This is ongoing research, but it does seem like uh, this is perhaps a new type or a new style of patoli board uh, in the Maya Lowlands. And you know, the next sort of step in some of this research would be that I would like to do is to look at all of the different places where we see these boards and the types or styles that are associated with those places and to see if there is a, maybe a regional differentiation. Perhaps, you know, in this part of Belize, or this part of the lowlands, people are playing on different kinds of boards and perhaps that's connected to the, the type of game or, or something else. We don't, we don't know, it's hard to tell. The architectural context of these patoli are also unique. Again, it's a wide open platform that would have looked something like this drawing. This is a reconstruction of, a, of an ancient Maya courtyard group. It would have looked something like this with this wide sort of entranceway, a few stairs leading up, this thatch roof. Um, and that's different than some of the residences that we usually find. For example, one of the other structures that we excavated was structure B2. This, this structure is directly across the courtyard from uh, B4 where the patoli were found. And its interior would have looked something like this picture over in the upper right hand corner. So this corbel vault, it's not really a true arch, it's kind of a false arch. And buildings sort of architecturally, they can only be so wide for that arch to work. I think I think the most is like three meters or something like that. So really not very wide. And the architecture with the Patoli boards is much more, as much as five meters wide, I believe, or three meters wide. And um, in any case, it's much wider than it would need for a vaulted residence. And so I don't really think it's a house. I think probably people were living here in this house and, um, conducting other activities in the Patoli house. So how do we interpret this? How do we, how can we think about these Patoli at Gallon Jug, which is a relatively smaller site with not really, these Patoli aren't found where they're normally found. They're found in a residential compound in this kind of unassuming platform uh, that's not a fancy temple or a palace. One interpretation is that these were carved perhaps by a ritual practitioner. Maybe this was uh, a residence of somebody that did was a diviner that invited people into this space and in, in, in sort of small groups and hosted them and did some kind of divining practice for them. One, we don't know that for sure. We don't know if they were doing this um, over and over again, if this was repetitive or they were, this was just one instance. So they just carved the Patoli boards to do a ritual or something and then, and then that was it. But it's possible that this was, if it's associated with ritual activity, um, that they potentially were uh, 
this was a, the house of a diviner. I also think it's an interesting, the use of space is interesting. It's not quite public and not quite private. Patoli boards are usually found in very private spaces, really small, smaller kind of rooms with of temples and things like that. And this is really a wide space. And you can see in this picture, um, those photos that I showed you before, this is one of our crew members, Mark Willis, taking those photos and me and the rest of the crew watching. But you can see that we're up on top of this pretty wide area. Um, you know, it's, it isn't that private. And so it it's really is a different, a different context. Another explanation for this is perhaps a termination ritual. And if you remember at the beginning of the lecture that objects, landscapes, buildings all have, they're all part of this kind of active um, life force that infuses everything in Maya worldview. So if buildings and places also have kind of a, a, a yeah, like an active sort of force or presence, you also have to then deactivate that if you're leaving, because it can be dangerous to leave things um, with kind of sort of unfinished uh, spirituality, I guess you would say. And so they, the Maya used to enact termination rituals when they abandoned uh, a building. And what they would do is they would, it takes a lot of different forms, but essentially they would break a lot of pottery, a lot of ceramic vessels, and they would scatter it all over the floor and perhaps do some burning, offer some incense, um, maybe cash some figurines, um, maybe play patoli on their way out the door as they abandon the site. Perhaps this is kind of a later time period. The artifact deposit that we excavated dates, at least those sherds were deposited um, around uh, like 775 AD or so, so towards the later part of the late classic. Perhaps things were going poorly for Gallon Jug. We don't know what, what that would have been, but perhaps this individual was trying to divine the future or relieve some anxiety of residents. And so they play a Patoli game and conduct a termination ritual and leave this huge artifact deposit for us to find <laughs> thousands of years later. Um, that is also a possibility. Finally, you know, we would like to go back and do some more excavations. I have lingering questions about these Patoli boards. You know, I have put forward a couple of interpretations that are that are a possibility, uh, but one that that is still possible is that, in, or, or in order to figure out who was living here, if this was the house of somebody that was divining, um, as you know, like an ongoing event is to investigate the earlier floor sequence. And we can see in the profile where part of it is broken that there are previous plasterings, previous uh, floors here. And so while it would be very, very hard for me to do, we could peel back these Patoli boards and destroy them essentially in order to investigate the lower floors and see if uh, Patoli are carved also on these previous floors. That would be an important piece of information. It would also be really interesting to see if there are any burials here. Burials are closed contexts, and so they contain a lot of interesting information for archaeologists. Uh, we could excavate beneath these floors, and maybe the person that lived in this, this courtyard group is buried there, and that would give us a lot of information about, um, about the, the residents uh, and, and how this was practiced. Or maybe they were just gambling. <laughs> and uh, you know, betting their, their cloaks and their jade and their uh, you know, valuable possessions. Um, it's hard to say, but it is, it is true. I hope that um, I've, I've shown that ritual and play can really coexist within the ancient Maya culture uh, and that we can learn a lot more about their daily practices through investigating these, these household groups. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for, for listening. I'd be happy to take questions if you have any um, or hear your reactions. All right. Does anybody have questions besides my questions in the chat box? Now would be the time. Or feel free to add it in the chat box if you feel more comfortable that way. I 
I can answer your questions, Brittany. <laughs> no problem. I'll read them off to you. Okay. All right. So you already answered my first question, so I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> what type of stone as usual? Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just, it was your very last slide, so you explained it all in full detail. <laughs> um, so uh, were there also occurrences of children playing ever? Um, we haven't seen, I don't think we've seen that in the ethno-historic record. Children okay. are difficult to see in the archaeological record. Um, you know, we see some toys, some toys potentially, like I showed the, the little um, sort of, cat on wheels, sort of feline on wheels before, um, but they're very difficult to see. And so some of the graffiti actually uh, is like on the on walls, not the totally boards, but some graffiti is actually interpreted as children's doodles, right? And children, some graffiti is like at kid level or it's like sideways if you can envision like a kid lying on their side and like mm. drawing. So sometimes graffiti is one way we can see kids in the archeological record. Um, but not not with Patoli so far. Yeah, I'm sure it's very difficult right now too, since there's not like you you even said it's very hard to determine stuff about this at this point right now. Yeah, uh, they're really difficult to to date. They're difficult to um, to understand. That's why I talk so much about the ethnohistoric record and worldview because uh, we really need to look for multiple lines of evidence. Now, do you have any evidence on the reasons that they may have vacated that building? Um. Not, not yet. We need to look more into the rest of the site. We didn't find any other abandonment evidence in the other buildings. Um, there is a burial that dates to the Terminal Classic that's right, that's in one of the other structures there, um, which gives us an idea of when that might have happened. Um, but there's been no other excavations at Gallon Jug to this extent, and so we don't know why they would have so yeah. what percent of gallon jug has been excavated, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I don't mind. Not the, just this. <laughs> Not very much at all. We've mapped it. The maps that you've seen, that's sort of the first step is to understanding kind of spatially where everything is. Um, but, and then we're, so we did some excavations in the main plaza in 2018, kind of un uncovering earlier, earlier structures from the early classic, but that's it. So not very much. Okay. And then uh, it looks like Michelle had a question as well. She said, were the boards oriented north to south? Good question. Yes, they seem to be. You can see from this last image, uh, that's kind of a, a dramatic uh, picture of it. I mean, we're trying to bring out the carvings there. Uh, you can see from the north arrow that, yeah, they do seem, except for that one that is kind of tilted the other direction, um, is, yeah, they do seem to be oriented north-south. And again, with the cardinal directions, linking this idea of kind of cosmovision and cosmology to this game, it seems significant that they are oriented that way. Awesome, great question. Mm -hmm. All right, Richard asks, what is the youngest Batoli board known? The youngest? Um, in the Maya region, they date to like the post, there's some from the post classic in the northern lowlands, so in Yucatan, that are probably like 1200 or 1300 AD. And then the, um, of course, we have Aztec versions of Patoli that we have from the colonial period. Um, and there's been some revival of, of Patoli, but um, mostly I think now they're kind of portable boards. I don't, obviously they're not incising them into monster floors anymore, um, but, does that answer your question, the youngest? I mean, yeah, so they're still around in the colonial period. And for the Maya region, probably the post-classic is the last ones that we see that we see carved. They're really difficult to date, though, as, as I was saying. You need associated artifacts and things like do that. They dif do they differ in different ways other than them being portable? Like, do you notice differences in the style or the sizes as, you know, time goes on? Or I mean, that's not so far. And that's one um, reason that I'd like to go back and look um, at the other literature and see if there are regional differences based on style. And that's one question you could answer with that potentially, but it doesn't seem like it right now. It seems like there's just a lot of variability um, when we find them. We need more examples probably. Okay, great. And uh, here's another question. What were the types of artifacts found on the Patoli board floor? I didn't, I didn't quite go into the artifact deposit as much in as much detail, um, but there were 
uh, ceramic artifacts, a lot of ceramic. So again, 4,000 sherds. I don't have a total vessel count, um, but they were mostly really wide, thick rimmed bowls. I don't know how much you guys know about ceramics, but they were very wide, wide rimmed, um, wide mouthed bowls, and then some storage jars. So it does suggest, it's sort of a normal household inventory, to be honest. There's also plates um, and dishes, but there was not like an overwhelming amount of serving ware. That was one question that I had from the, the ceramic evidence was if they're hosting people here, are they hosting feasts and you know having patoli at the same time? It doesn't really seem like that. It seems like it's kind of a standard uh, inventory of household ceramic items. There weren't a lot of sensors or anything like that for burning incense. There were um, mono and matate fragments, so they were doing some food processing, grinding corn probably, and some stone tools, some uh, obsidian blades and some chert uh, bifaces. Again, so they were beautiful artifacts, but uh, mostly it seemed like they were pretty standard, pretty normal, right? They weren't they weren't too exceptional, um, which is interesting. It could have been just, again, with the termination ritual, sometimes you don't need anything special in order to uh, have a termination ritual. It's just the things that you have in your house and you um, sort of break them on the floor and leave. Is that something that um, you see at higher class sites, like in the temples and stuff as well? Mm -hmm. You see that throughout. You see that um, at, yeah, household residents, just households, commoner residences, and then also in elite contexts. In elite contexts, sometimes they can, it can be violent. Like you'll see, uh, sometimes a termina termination ritual is done on purpose, like I described. And then sometimes uh, it seems like somebody else has come in and like disturbed an ancestor burial or something um, and, and kind of terminated the building for you. Um, so they can be violent as well and more hmm. politically charged spaces. Um, but yes, you see them in lots of different ways. Makes sense. I have another question too. Do you have any theories on why um, patoli boards are found more in the lowlands? Is that just because there's like more archaeology that's been excavated in that area or? I think so. I think it's probably an excavation bias. It's interesting because um, in the highlands is actually where you have more Maya day keepers in the present day. So not shamans exactly, but Maya people who are keeping the, the sort of ritual calendar going. Um, so it's interesting that we haven't seen any really any examples um, yet. I think it's probably an excavation bias, as you point out. There's been so much work done at a sites like Tikal and Shunan Tunich um, that the smaller sites up in the Maya highlands are, are not as investigated. It's also possible that Patoli boards are present on perishable materials. So you might also get that, that sort of archeological bias that we all always right. have to consider that this might also be happening on wood or you know leather or something and then we don't see it archeologically. And so it's possible that they're doing it in a different way in the highlands and we just can't, um, we can't sound visible archeologically. I would love to see all the, the Mayan stuff all out from underneath the jungle, but that'll be impossible. And it's not the right thing to do, of <laughs> course. But man, I would love to get all of it in context, all in one piece, you know? Of course, we would love that. <laughs> we're often, like, we're left with more questions than, than answers sometimes. Oh, that's the fun of it, though. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Last chance. All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Claire Novotny for coming to lecture for us today. It's very informative and it was some fresh, good material. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And uh, hopefully you'll come back and lecture for us again in the future. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Good night, everybody. Bye.